Welcome to Access Chat. We've got Ted Coyne here with us today. Our topic today is one that's close to all of our hearts. It's, it's around social. Ted's written a book which you can just see behind his head um, called A World Gone Social. Um, it's a really important topic for all of us. You know, we spend most of our lives on social media, believe greatly in the power of social to connect people and to take things forward. But Ted also has another connection to Access Chat and, and that connection is dyslexia. So Ted and I connected over an article that I wrote via Antonio through social. Um, and uh, so we, we started talking and, and um, well, here we are. So welcome, Ted. Um, glad to have you here. Neil, Deborah, Antonio, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. So. Um, so what got you started on, on social media? What attracted you to, to social? I've been, uh, let's see, I started my first business that actually started paying bills in 2001. But I got on, uh, let's see, I started speaking. I've been a public speaker and an author since 2005. So 2009, and I got on LinkedIn early, but I didn't really care for it. It was just, you know, boring. And Facebook, and that was nice to get back in touch with my friends. But finally, 2009, my my um just a friend of mine said ted you're an author you've got to check out this thing twitter which i you know heard of but i i heard the bad press which a lot of people still are stuck it stuck in their head oh yeah who cares what you had for lunch <laughs> drives me so crazy true. bad branding <laughs> by the people yes, who yes. founded the company so anyway that's a different story for like you know better branding chat or something uh, but for <laughs> our purposes today 2009 i just got on there to get the word out, and what I found instead of telling people my fascinating thoughts is uh, I met some absolutely fascinating people from around the world. Now, Antonio is one example of this, where you're in Spain, right, sir? Uh, I mean, I'm Portuguese, but I'm in Ireland Port for uh, almost 10 years. Ireland. Okay, I apologize. All right. So, but that's the thing. So, you know, I, if I get up in the middle of the night and I check Twitter... There's somebody in, you know, Mumbai who who's says something interesting that keeps me up, unfortunately, right? Yeah. This is the power of social. You're connected to the whole world, and especially Twitter, the most conversational of all the different platforms. So, Yeah, I, 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 I agree. It's definitely the most conversational. Um, I also do the same thing. 5.30 in the morning, my dogs want to get up and go outside. I get sucked into the stream and, and then realize I should be going back to bed. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? But it happens. Yes. <laughs> Daily. Yes. Um, and Deborah's the same. I see stuff coming out all kinds of times and I know it's not automated or not all of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a bad habit. So. Or a good habit. Depending you on know, how you're looking whatever. At it. it's, it's the habit that I, I hate the expression. It is what it is, but it, it's good or bad. It, it depends how you use it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think it's a phenomenal thing. Uh, well, we wouldn't be here talking if it wasn't for Twitter. There's so many good things that come out from it. Uh, the stuff that we've managed to do in terms of awareness has been phenomenal. Um, really, really excited that we're just starting. We've been doing it nine months and we're you know, mm -hmm. doing pretty well. Um, but I, you know. I, I'm also interested in how you see, you know, you're talking in your book about, you know, companies needing to engage more, be much more social, understand and have conversations with customers, and how we might use that to get them conversing with our particular uh, cohort of users, people with disabilities, people with cognitive issues, where we are sometimes shut out. Uh, I think we're going to have a greater voice. So perhaps you can talk around that a little bit. Absolutely. So the neat thing about social when you get it right is there's the social aspect of it, not the broadcasting aspect. So, you know, in the industrial age, we had nothing better than billboards and TV ads. That was all that was available. But in the social age, companies are still acting like that. They're, you know, they share Twitter announcements or Facebook posts for you to like. They don't interact with you, but some companies are really savvy on this. And my, my personal specialty is the social CEO and the social CEO. What can you do as a business leader when you're on there? So whether you lead a business of yourself or 100,000, 
you still can get on there and talk to your customers. And not only that, brands can talk to their customers. And whether it's social or not, you know, brands can engage with an audience they can kind of drill down. So for instance, Dove had a you know wonderful thing for women who were not stick figures, right? Yeah. Uh, a few yeah. years ago. And it was it was so awesome. Like my mom has yes. been she's 85 years old. She's she's fine, but she's not a stick figure. She just loved them so much more. She's been using Dove like my whole life. But when that ad campaign came out, she was like, wow. Now how could this you know, that's a company with a heart, a company with a soul. And, you know, people, it's not just millennials, as my mom attests. People are, they will buy from a company that they think actually cares about the stuff they care about. Now, you know, when you talk about disabilities, as you, as you people know, it's not, you know, one thing. It's many different sure. disabilities, and some of them may be different abilities. But with social, you know, if a brand really wants to show they care, one way they can do that is to engage communities of special interest. And if, if they show that they have a heart, you know, it's so much better than just a, an advertising campaign for the CSR initiative. You know, that's a lot of companies think of that as a box to check. So much more than a box to check. These people can become your passionate advocates. They'll talk about you when you're not there to urge them to talk about you. That's that's word of mouth. Social is word of mouth on steroids. That's it. Yeah. And you know what, Ted? You know what, Ted? <laughs> I think one thing that's interesting about that is that when we do talk about the brand, I think mm -hmm. we're more credible at talking about the brand than they are about talking about themselves. And so I talk about brands all the time in positive ways and I it's always fascinating to me to see which brands engage back and which yeah. ones don't engage back. And I'm right. still amazed that brands do not engage back. Now when I'm chattering with brands, I'm chattering positive things. For example, I as Neil and Antonio know, I've been living in Embassy Suites in Piscataway, New Jersey for several months now, back and forth. And I've reached out to them multiple times because I think they do such a great job with their team uh -huh. and they never respond. And oh. I think, oh, Embassy Suites, come on, engage with us. And yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm a big loyal fan of Embassy Suites. And so, um, but it's really interesting when the brands engage back with us. And so what I yeah. spend a lot of time doing is, you know, reminding the brands, for example, Toyota just was a big sponsor of Special Olympics. And so I had engaged a couple of times with them because they're doing some wonderful commercials that um, includes Amy Purdy, who is a beautiful young woman that also happens to have a disability. So when they engaged, they actually sent me a little note and said, will you tweet about this? So I thought, oh, good for you, Toyota, for yeah. engaging with us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um... And that's really funny because I was at an event. I'm going to tie two things together at the same time. One of them was I gave a keynote, like, I don't know, a month or two ago at the um, Ritz-Carlton in South Beach, Florida. And um, it was awesome because just, you know, I was just going to speak. And somebody from their team reached out to me and we started engaging in conversation. And sure, I had a lot of good things to say about them. Embassy Suites is completely missing the mark. You're right. You are on the yeah. money. Um, and, great. And, just, and you lead a community, so engaging with you, you are an influencer. You know, no? come on. All right, so that's the first thing about NBC Suites and the Ritz. Now, um, the other thing is one of the other speakers there was a vice president of sales at Toyota. So here is this guy at, talking about, you know, how to get the word out. And, and here you are. That's a perfect example. They're doing it right. They're nailing it. And, yes. um, you know, from, from the brief exchange that we had at the conference, he seems like he actually does care about people. So it's nice when a company truly cares and is not faking it. You, you can't fake it internally no. on, on social. You'll, you'll be exposed if you are faking it. But, you know, they care about people. They want real people buying their real cars. Wow, what a great opportunity it is for them. Yeah, it's wonderful. They're making the world a better place by supporting causes that do that, right? Yeah. Yes. That's, yes. I mean, nobody loses in this except, you know, whoever competes against Toyota. So, you know, <laughs> Honda and Chevy do lose in this because Toyota's doing it right. So, you know, yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. And no, I, I, I see the same thing. So I, I do engage and I engage both positive and negatively because I'm a consumer. So if I have a good right. experience, I'll, I'll talk about the good experience um, and I'll talk about the bad ones. And it's really interesting to see which companies are really switched on. So I had a bad experience with a, a, a paint. So it's fence fence paint um, right. it's called Ron Seal. I don't think you have it in the States, but, but its strap line is it does what it t says on the tin. And it's water-based, and the rain came, and it all washed off. <laughs> and, and so I took a picture. <laughs> Which you might think an outdoor paint you might want to think that through. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? So I took a picture, and I posted it on, and, and it said, when Ron Seal doesn't do what it says on the tin. Within five minutes, their team were on. Like they, they came back to me. They sent me out another five liter tub and said, but next time, just um, wait until the temperature comes up a little bit and then it sets and then it won't wash off. But, okay. you know, they were they were absolutely, you know, on it. You know, they knew what they were doing. Something else it's, broke. And, and, yeah. and, and, and I was just trying to get a spare part. And it's cheaper to buy the whole thing again on eBay than buy the spare part of this other company. And, and, and they're not they're not actually engaging. And it's like, oh, come on. You know, this is an opportunity to, to turn things around and, and really um, engage in conversations. And you can tell that the companies just haven't got that strategy in place. Yeah, it's, it's so true. Um, you know, so companies, in our book, 12 different times, um, my co-author counted this, we say more social, less media. And that's really the theme yeah. of the social age. You know, please, please don't look at this as a blunt instrument. It's a really, it's a really, really nice fine-tuning instrument. You can totally engage with whoever all the time, all day long. And when your brand does that, you can just absolutely knock it out of the park. And, and as you're, you guys are coming up with great examples, thank you, by the way, of um, note to self. Uh, because, you know, when brands are there, when they engage, wow, how wonderful is that? And um, it feels yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's remarkable to me. And when they don't, you just sit there and you say to yourself, this is actually, um, I, I do you know, what you guys are describing, I kick the social media tires all the time. I just see, you know, like, hey, what can you do with this? Who, you know, if I do this, will it work out? So one day I wanted running shoes and I figured, hey, let's go to Twitter. And, you know, long story short, it's it's in the book, but long story short, Nike didn't reply to me. Um, Zappos disappointed me, which is rare, by the way. Um, New Balance didn't reply to me, just on and on. All these big brands didn't reply to me. And one little, a, a summer intern actually, at a company with eight employees. Totally, wow. totally knocked it out of the park. So this guy, um, this guy at um, Topos, a company I'd never heard of before, said, hey, Ted, I'll, buy, I'll sell you some shoes. And we got in a conversation, and it was just a wonderful, magical experience. So cool that I'm talking about it. You know, this is two years later. We stuck it in her book. I can't tell you how many people said, you know, out of all the examples in the book, what Topos did really rang home with me. How cool is that? Just, you know, they were just doing what was smart, by the way. They weren't doing, you know, anything over and above. In 2015, no, this is what you do. You talk to people. It's social media. It's not media media. All right. You know I could go on for hours. I, I get angry. No, no. we No, because we all love this topic. And I know, Ted, that we were thinking about going in one direction. Um, but we sort, no, but I, one thing that I did with social media was I looked around and I saw the community that I care about so much, disability, all of that, that we weren't really having a powerful voice on this medium. And so that's one reason why I became, plus I'm very social, so I became determined to figure this out. And the way Neil and Antonio and I met w was because a little, almost, well, I guess I wouldn't call it a failed. No, let, 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 let me, De Deborah, let me interrupt you. Just that for, I just want to introduce something real no, small, but but that captures the best of online conversations is how random this can be, and how rewarding the random of conversations that we meet people that we never expect. How wonderful yeah. this is! Sorry, it for is. You. It's amazing. No, no, do interrupt because I think that. The, what could be very powerful for Access Chat is what do we do as a community to up our game even more? So um, when we were looking, we're, you know, we have guests um, scheduled out 
into 2016. And Antonio said, we've got to have Ted on. We've got to have Ted on. And when you agreed, we were so excited because we're like, oh, oh, the superstar is coming up. We were like starstruck. Okay, okay. That's, please, you've got to stop. I beg you. <laughs> well, we were so stoked. And so I think this is so powerful. Even what, when I did this little tiny little tweet chat one day, Neil and Antonio, they reached out to me and they said, hey, you want to do a real one together? And I thought, I don't even know who, who these guys, who's Atos? Sorry, typical American. I know who Atos <laughs> is now a multi-billion dollar company. But, um, and a lot of people know Atos. But what we've done, it's, it's worse. We are so surprised. And I'll tell you, who else is really surprised is Atos. Atos is saying, whoa, whoa, what are y'all doing over there? Because they have, sorry, Atos, they have social media experts, and then they got Neil and Antonio just rocking it. And so it's so amazing. And I think the power for our community, in a positive way, to have our voices be heard, to have these brands interacting with us, for Toyota to know that not only do I own four Toyotas, and I've Oh, I've owned so many Toyotas. But at the same time that I have a daughter with Down syndrome and I care about this community enough so that they remembered it and they sent this marketing team to me and said, will you please send these tweets if you're comfortable with them? Well, they were about Special Olympics. Of course I'm comfortable. So I, I just think that this is a real... And we haven't had this particular topic because generally it's a, the three of us are doing a lot of the chatter for, for our community on social media, but Ted, we just love who you are and what you're bringing to the table, so. Well, thank you very much. You know, I'm passionate about um, people. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I was bullied one time too many as a kid, and it's just not right. And um, I'm smiling about that, but it's God on his truth. Oh. And, um, and, and just when people exclude others or discount them, you know, when I was just to, not to complain, but to talk about my very tiny little disability for a minute, you know, my first grade teacher told my mom, she thought I was retarded and would, would hold me back, but I had a bigger vocabulary than her. So I got to go to second grade. Okay. That's what being dyslexic was like in the seventies. And I know it's not always better. No. Um, and that's, you know, and that's like a, a nothing, you know, my, my level of dyslexia, I kind of compensated and got over it. Some people have it much worse and some people have other disabilities much worse. And when you exclude people who have disabilities, um, it's just, it hurts all of society. It doesn't just hurt the person with the disability or even the group with the disability. It hurts the rest of society who could benefit from interacting with, exchanging insights with these people who are different from them, who may have some wonderful perspectives because they're not the same as everyone else. You know, it just makes me mad. Yes. And so, yeah, right. I mean, I, I don't think it doesn't make anyone in the disabilities community mad, right? But what can brands do? Getting back to, you know, my, my area of, of business guy, I, I, for two years, I was very involved, very, uh, like 100 hours a week involved in nonprofits down here in Naples, Florida. There's a really vibrant nonprofit community. And um, that's not my strength. It's just not. Uh, my strength is business, so I went back to business. And um, But I'll tell you, you know, working with the different groups around here uh, was such a valuable exposure, you know? There are people whose brains are working perfectly, but their bodies are not. There are people who uh, could have valuable, you know, jobs, for instance, working as a, a bagger in a grocery store and do a better job as a bagger in a grocery store right. than somebody who just, you know, that's the best job they could get and they hate it, right? I mean, there are, there are places where people can actually shine, not just get along. And when companies take advantage of that in a positive way, by supporting them, showing they care, wow, that's cool. So whether it's Toyota supporting the Special Olympics, whether it's, you know, another company, um, one of the companies, sorry? Walgreens? Walgreens, Microsoft, IBM, yeah, yeah. we got some great examples. Yeah, you know, um, there's a book that I want to recommend to everybody. By the way, there's there's um, two of them. And the first one is called The Dyslexic Advantage. And it talks about, now it's been a while since I read it, but the author talks about four different types of dyslexic um, mind, 
you know? And the bottom, the, the thing is, she says there's not just one type of dyslexia, there's four. And so uh, she gives an example that really stuck with me of an engineer. Now imagine being an engineer with dyslexia, and this person was very successful at what she did. But she worked for a very large company, and she thought uh, successfully and was best at her field by taking some time to look out the window and really piece some things together. And when she got a new jo a boss, the new boss was like, oh, you know, you're not at your desk. And, you know, yeah, I'm not at my desk because this is how I provide value. I'm working on a problem right now. And staring at my screen isn't going to help me do that. And um, so anyway, that was just one of the many rich examples in this book of people who actually can thrive in the right environment with a disability. Um, and another one, I don't know what this is, if mental illness is part of your It is. Idea. Okay. So I just love, I love leadership and I love, you know, different ways of like you know, studying how are people successful, et cetera. So there's another book that I really, really loved also called The Hypomanic Edge. And um, it's really, so hype, people know, you know, mania from bipolar, um, yeah, cool. mania is, is debilitating. Mania, you, you may... Um, be unable to finish sentences type of thing and, and need severe medication. Hypomania is a bit less. It's turned on extra hard. And so this guy was saying how a little bit of craziness, that's the title of the book, he's a psychologist by the way who treats hypomanics, how a little bit of craziness leads to a lot of success. And um, so he, his thesis is that a lot of leaders are hypomanic and that's why they're like you know he takes as an example and I'm not a psychologist I don't know but Bill Clinton is a guy who's just like a voracious he, the guy never rested he was always on he used it to an advantage so these are two books that I absolutely love but getting back to companies and social media how can they take advantage of building their brands because what you want to do as a business leader is you want to build customers for life and you want those customers to care enough about your company to be loyal enough that they're going to tell their friends when you're not around. Right. You know, when yeah. you're not there advertising at them, you want them to be your ambassadors, telling the world how, you know, wonderful you are. If they can support a chat like yours, there's, there's two ways that can go. They can either push it and take advantage of you by, you know, not giving you any type of compensation. And that's unfortunate. Or they can be a little gentler, a little more inclusive, a little more value added and do something like, you know, hey, we have some ads for the Special Olympics. Do you think your community might find these of value? And if so, would you mind sharing them? That gentle touch is right. it's a wonderful thing. You know, um, it's not a fine line either. It's a very broad line. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Stray all over the place, stray like crazy. Um, anyway, really, really break. good points, though. Really good points, Antonio. No, 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 no. I, I was just, you know, listening. Uh, we, 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 we found that that the community that is and that moves around Access Chat is really committed and passionate about the topics that we that we bring, and then. What we also try to do is is not just we, we try to see what they are publishing and and trying to bring and that to our own co conversation and to mm -hmm. and to uh, is not just okay we, can you please share what you're doing is we try to share what they are doing and we try to have some we, we, we try to have some interest for the activities that they are developing and we we want them to them to be comfortable with us in that way we want them okay Antonio I'm doing this can you just look into it we, we want to to create that type of, of, of relation with them to avoid oh uh, we are here no it is just it's not just a, it's, it's not just about us it's also about uh, yourselves and if you find something for us just send that send that to us and try to curate curate good things that could be interesting for 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 the old community it's mutually beneficial so we want to support our supporters um, and 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 so far we've got a lot of people going out there advocating for us you know be, be, I'm amazed at, at how many people are out there telling other people about what's going on usually before I have um, <laughs> so, yeah, which which is a great demonstration of exactly what you know you're, you're talking about in, in your book people advocating stuff and really buying buying into the yeah access chat is now a brand it's not 
you know, we're not for profit, but it's a brand. It's 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 early days, but but you know, effectively we're up there. You know, we're getting huge huge engagement in the chats. It's what, up probably in the top ten globally, which is quite. No, we, we quite actually a, we have a very you know, small, but they're a very committed community. Mm -hmm. So and and because they they have curated their accounts in a certain way, so when you compare, you know. The, the shares and the mentions, we realize that we are able to achieve a very interesting spread because the accounts are very structured. You no, know, they they really spend some have spent some time in the way how they create their accounts, and that has benefited us in a in a in a very interesting way. Yeah. You know, I just um, have been working on some posts. Uh, I haven't written a long blog post in forever, by the way, because I fell in love with Metal, my company, mm -hmm. and um, it's such a cool tool. You can just you read something you curate it with context it's called so I'll just create a quick metal and share it five minutes and I'm on to my next thing so I finally sat down today and said okay we've got to talk about influencer marketing in more detail yes. and what you yeah and and what you're describing with the community that isn't just you know there but is uh, attached well to its second class uh, second like level that's so important it's not just you know how many followers do you have or whatever not how many likes you get or, or, or all that junk. It's, um, and they're better than nothing. They are. I mean, if you have no metrics, use those metrics, right? But you do have more metrics. You have better metrics. And so there's this tool, and I am so not under the, uh, you know, sponsorship of Little Bird, but there's this tool called Little Bird. And um, the, uh, the analytics they do is they don't just look at, okay, who is talking a lot about a topic, be it disabilities or, you know, social business, whatever. They also talk about who is paying attention to them. So it's not just the first level of, you know, that's very shallow. How many impressions are you getting? Okay, big deal. Who's paying attention? Because you may be getting um, impressions that go out to, you know, say you're, I don't know, Toyota, and the only people paying attention to you are middle school kids. That is completely worthless to you, right? <laughs> Who cares? And if you're paying somebody to deliver impressions and that, that's what they're getting, you know, you could be like a brand only selling in, the, in a portion of the United States and most of the people paying attention to you are in Egypt. Okay? Money These things are, it drives me insane. So, so getting an analytics tool that tells you exactly who is paying attention, your community could benefit dearly, by the way, you know? Um, and so brands that, that, you know, get involved and take advantage in, in a good way. I know that phrase is kind of loaded, but take advantage of, you know, these guys care about this stuff. Our employees care about this stuff, which is why we are going to help them in their mission. This could be a really, really virtuous relationship in an ongoing way. Um, and as far as the members of your community, maybe, you, you know, you have community members who either have disabilities or they have loved ones who have disabilities, like Deborah, right? And when they are creating content to share, when you support their content, you probably do it just because you are, as we say in the book, relentless givers, right? This is, this is what I would do, of course. I mean, this is my, my friend, my community member. Doing that intentionally is just smart also. Like, our communities create stuff. Let's share that stuff. Yeah. You know, and then same thing with companies. You know, the first thing that a company or the first thing that a, any type of for profit and even non profits should do is say, okay, what's in it for you? Why would you want to help us? Don't assume it drives me crazy. I can't tell you how many, um, you know, companies say, hey, Ted, you know, we'd like you to be an influencer for us and come to this event. Like, really? Come to an event and tweet. That's what you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you realize that I'm a professional speaker? Like, that I go to events all the time. I what? A oh, free hotel room? Oh, cool. Thanks. You know, what I mean, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we get that. Person. We totally get that. We totally yeah, get exactly. that. Like, same thing, ridiculous. So you're living in an embassy suites. You don't want a free hotel room either. You want the no. opposite of hotel yes. room, right? Yes. I want to be home for a while. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Like, how could we make it easy for you to be home for a while? If they provided you with that, you'd be like, yeah. <laughs> Ask. Ask how. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We get up by soapbox. <laughs> influencer, influencer marketing done bad. You know, I anything in social, the way companies are doing it, probably 90% of them are getting it grossly wrong. 
and, so, and it uh, lights me up. I'm being, I'm not following protocol. Neil, um, I have oh, a question, okay. obviously, sorry. Um, Cause you've got me so stoked about this, Ted. I'm like putting little notes in here to remember all this stuff. But so what would you say, cause we are all, we're all influencers and we're building our influence, blah, blah, blah. What could we do, not only the three of us, but anybody that's watching Access Chat, what can we do to be more influential, and I say that sincerely, in a positive way, to really help this community that we're all part of and we care about so, more, so much? What should we be doing more of to build our influence? I think, you know, one thing that I would do, besides, it, part of it is that you're just going to continue to exist and to have... Um, the guests on your show who are on your chat who will then, you know, proselytize for you because they're happy to, right? And some, by the way, do it much better than others. I have learned some fascinating and shocking things about that. Um, some of the people with the biggest audiences um, do not. Yes. <laughs> Let me say, that let me say yes. when I used to have a, a TV show and interview, like authors and what have you, um, not a real TV show, by the way, just, a, you know, a Google Hangout TV show. Um, but when I used to do that, the person with by far the highest profile was the show that was least watched. So just, you know, be careful. Be selective. Um, you don't want to take her. You want a relentless giver. So sometimes you just have to learn by trial, you know. <laughs> okay, anyway. So um, having people who proselytize for you will help you build, right? Um, absolutely. So just keep doing that. Continue doing it intentionally as well as, as instinctively. Um, another thing is, you know, you're a really awesome fit for uh, things like hospitals and other medical practitioners who serve um, people with disabilities. Make relationships with them. Just, just talk to them. Like literally go from finding them on social to talking to them on Skype, you know, one-to-one -one or whatever. Just see where that goes. That's oh, another mistake people have. Yeah, it's another it's another misperception that people have is that like what starts on social stays there. No, I, I mean, I spend a lot of my day not on Twitter. You know why? Because I find people on Twitter and then I'm like, hey, let's talk. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. and it's <laughs> it's it's intentional. I don't do it just like randomly. You know, um, I don't think anybody should. That that's a good way to to not earn money, right? But doing it, <laughs> don't do that. Some people, some people will say, "Do that. Don't do that." Um, but doing it intentionally, so like you know, oh wow, this hospital really is a specialist in this area. We've got a community member who's you know a caregiver and really cares about this. Let's see how we can bring them together, bring the hospital in. You know, that's one wonderful way to do it. We've got a great yeah. one coming up. It's um, we've got a lady um, who who runs a hashtag on Instagram and Twitter is called Hospital Glam. And, okay. And, and Glam, like glamour? Yeah, so, so basically they're, they're doing selfies of themselves all made up inside the hospitals un undergoing treatment. It's fantastic. Oh, fun. Love yeah. it. I love that. You know, it's, it's fantastic. That. That's cool. So, so uh, really what they're doing is they're reclaiming um, themselves and, and their, their self-image um, despite illness so um and and she's a she's a medic speaker she's talking at the medics conference at stanford um she's also um a, a riot girl at heart and um they've got some of the suicide girls um partaking in in some of the the photos as well so you might know about the suicide girls ted well it's you know not safe for work necessarily some of it. <laughs> um, but but essentially hey, 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 um hey. Way, Essentially, so. um, you know, I think it's a fantastic idea. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, it is. Oh, it is. reaching out to to those other communities, and it's great that we see some of the people that have been speakers and have been guests coming back week after week, and that's really yeah. gratifying because then we know that we've made a proper connection. No, exactly. I, 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 and we, we we were able to uh, to find a few startups uh, working in, working in this area and invite them to join the conversation and at the same time that we are having the conversation we realize oh we we after the skype call we realize okay uh, oh i didn't know that we can do this so we end up helping them and supporting them after and and show them the value of this type of conversations and then uh, one week later they are just sending us messages and trying to, and telling us, okay, I didn't realize that we could do so much 
and how important conversations on Twitter can uh, the reach that we could get. We have someone yeah. uh, a week ago saying, "Oh, uh, after talking with you, I have someone from the British Parliament following me." So, uh, so yeah, so, that's cool. uh, yeah, that was really cool. So you have that feedback that is extremely interesting. Exactly. And see, that's the thing. So, you know, you've got a startup and whether they're funded or not is another issue. Hopefully, this advice to startup leaders and business leaders in general, when you are funded, you may want to think about a sponsorship package. Okay. Some way. All right. Um, but the other thing just makes you so angry when people take, take, take. Um, but the other thing is, um, you know, this example is, is perfect because these, you know, um, one of the authors in the bookshelves behind me um, calls it random collisions. You know, and they're so rich, so incredibly valuable. You never know until you know. Here's a here's a startup. Here's uh, some po potential users of their technology. Here's people who can amplify their message in a positive way. Here's government, which may be able to buy from them. Or wow, I mean, who knew? Yeah. And by the way, technology. You know, you've got all these tech startups today. It's like the the late '90s. <clears throat> I hope. I hope only. I, I hope only in the amount of um, activity and innovation, and not in the bubble. But anyway, um, you've got all these tech startups out there who are really revolutionizing what we're doing, and and it just a lot of them are health-related tech startups, which is incredibly valuable. You know, I mean, there was something I was I think it was NPR. Um, I was driving. I live in Naples, Florida. I was driving up to Tampa. It's like a two-hour drive. I'm listening to NPR, and there was somebody on there talking about, um, like maybe the next iteration of Google Glass might involve helping blind people to see. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, well, like the the that. prosthetics. Um, I think you guys were mentioning earlier um, the the prosthetics today have just incredibly like sometimes they're even better in in um, physical performance than what people can do. Or, or as good. It's amazing, right? What if blind people could see again? You know, one of the one of the notes I took for myself before this talk was Helen Keller, that the amazing things she did. Well, imagine if Helen Keller could see. I mean, wow, we're we're getting there. We're you know, it, and it may be another ten years before that particular one happens. For some individuals, it may be never. You know, depending on nerve damage or whatever. But just imagine these things. Oh. So, no, oh, well, we live. We live in this. World. That's one of the, this is one of the exciting things about that, that that keeps me as an assistive tech person is that that actually people think it's a weird area of tech, but actually it's it's on the bleeding edge. We get to play with all the toys, and and, and people with um, and, and companies need to understand that people with disabilities are fantastic early adopters of technology. We put up with all of the faults and the foibles. Of your crappy alpha beta code uh, uh, and, and your first generation product because it enables us as a group to um, do stuff that we were never able to do before. So, you know, what a great bunch of, of, of early testers, you know, that you've got there. And, and if you get it right, you've got those customers for life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And those advocates for life. Yeah. Yeah, very loyal. Very loyal. Yeah. No, Stand. if you remember, we have a conversation. Is about about with with Ian about uh, uh, about gamers, and he was able to show that you no know, uh, people who build games for people you know who have a, that people with disability can play with. You no, know, they yeah. became you know they they became you know very supportive of, of that game because there's not many opportunities for them, so they really support uh, those who care about uh, something that they they can actually use and they have fun with. Yeah, yeah. And the the fun aspect, I'm a huge fan of gamification. Like, you know, why not? And I look at how much trouble it was probably the dyslexia that made learning a foreign language in school hard for me. And then um I look at my my wife and daughters are all learning to use um Duolingo to master Spanish and I'm like, "Wow, you guys cuz I'll tell you, you know, I'll be I'll be reading in bed uh cuz I'm boring with my <laughs> wife and um <laughs> Totally G-rated show here, folks. I'll be reading it for my wife, and she'll be like, "Oh my God, it's 11, and I haven't done Duolingo yet. Quick, because you know it it rewards you for how many days and reminds you. And, and if you okay. hit midnight, it goes back to zero. So <laughs> this is, and I'm like, 
wow, they don't teach this to my elementary school kid. You know, they don't teach foreign languages yet in school, but she's learning herself and it's fun. Wow, how cool is that? Like, gamifying, just, okay, I, that's another another chat. That's another whole <laughs> chat, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know about that program. I need to learn Spanish bad. bad. I do like every language is crazy. No, yeah. no. Oh, that is so cool. I, I, fun, which, which is so, you know, having lived through first, um, the, I'm not exaggerating. My, my French teacher told me the second time I went through French, he told me in high school, he said, if you promise not to take French next year, I will give you a D. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. I got out. D works. A D works. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, it's a bit like me with math. <laughs> I know. Oh yeah. Don't even talk about algebra. Like algebra was. Forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Is it? Yeah. Oh no. Gives me nightmares. I I I actually um I had a job working for a bookmakers, a big bookmakers in, in the UK. Uh, and I was doing it because I'd started my own business, which needed some money. Uh, selling vinyl, just as we went. You do a lot of things age. for that reason, don't yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> I know. But, but, but um, basically, they, they thought, oh, this guy is great. You know, he's bright. Management material. Failed every single exam. Couldn't do it. You know, couldn't work out why I couldn't settle bets, but I was getting all of the formula. Bet settling is just the biggest bunch of algebraic formula you'll ever come across under time pressure with people screaming yeah. at you going, where's my money? You know, just, don't ever work in a bookmakers if you're dyslexic. It's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really funny. When you said bookmaker, I thought you were talking about a publisher, a uh, printer, yeah. and instead you're talking <laughs> <laughs> oh, on the horses and on the on the dog. I love that story. Yeah, if you can't do math accurately, you're gonna have hell to pay, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it was it was pretty pretty bad. Um. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I'll tell you though, career choice. That yeah, exactly. No, that whole test thing. Though. So think about this. Think about companies that limit their own talent pool by testing. Uh, incoming employees or, you know, people going up the ranks in management for the next position, testing them in ways that they are not uh, able to thrive. Um, and I get my dyslexia from my dad. My dad, incredibly intelligent man. I mean, this man was very, very smart. I wish I were half as smart as he was. Um, when he was in his first job, he, um, you know, his boss was like, wow, this guy's talent. And so he wanted him to... Um, go into a management, you know, training program. And um, my dad did poorly on the test. So what the guy did in order to make it happen, because it was the government, was he said, okay, we're going to have two people in this one person position. We're just going to make it double <laughs> so that you and the guy who outscored you can both go. And that's how he worked around that. But thank God this person was insightful. You know, you have a lot of companies or government or whatever who say, oh, no, you did poorly on the test. Never mind. You're out. Really? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Tests are incredibly limiting to people of talent. Yes. Because they don't think that way, not because they're not smart. Yeah. And it's just angering. I, I've often wondered if I have some dyslexia because I am very smart, but you put algebra in front of me, and I one time was courted by a very large financial organization to join them and I had a ton of experience as right. in charge of their corporate university and they put a stupid algebra test in front of me so what I did was God yeah. took the test I had no clue so it was like um, is it A? I mean I did like I had no idea yeah. so it was yeah. like are you kidding me? But right. I would have made their university the best corporate university in the United States, which I've done before. But that's fine. That's it's so short-sighted. So short-sighted. It is. Uh, you know, I I don't like to dwell on the negative, but if I did, um, <laughs> I'd like to write a book called "An Extraordinary Lack of Vision." Yes. Oh, oh good. Great. No, I, we, I, we we recently talk about this in also in the way our companies recruit people yeah. and sometimes right. during the recruitment process you are submitted to a number of tests that basically are too generic and th they are not inclusive and they are you are already excluding people because you are 
you have designed a test that only applied to a fraction of the of the population. Yeah, especially with entrepreneurial entrepreneurial people. If we're talking about you know people that are on the neurodiverse spectra, people like yeah. yourself, me, Branson, people like Lena, who we had on a few weeks ago, who mm -hmm. is super intelligent, you know. Um, but we don't think in straight lines, you know, there's another guy. So you've been recommending books left, right and center. I'm going to recommend one now. And it's actually called No Straight Lines. It's by oh, a good. I love it already. Yeah. Right. It's by a guy called Alan Moore. He okay. has um, a great history in, in terms of understanding trends and people. It's about how um, we have a trilemma of, of, of things going on right now between the, the old way of doing work and communities and everything else and, and craft and everything. Brilliant guy. Ten years ago, he wrote a book called Communities Dominate Brands. Ten years ago. Wow. Guys, see that is vision. That's the opposite of a lack of vision. Yeah. Right? He's right, so right. dyslexic. Um, and again, you know, these, these people don't do well in tests. Yeah. I, I, I always do far worse in tests than I do if I'm speaking to people, I love speaking to people. Yeah, that's why we're already 10 minutes over on our half hour. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's that's totally. somebody else's problem. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but entrepreneurialism, I know that's a, 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 an area where you're also fascinated. So um, maybe we'll just you know, squeeze in an extra 10 minutes. Yeah, all right, so, so let's go there because I love that. And I think, you know, one of the ways that maybe Antonio ta thought to, um, hooked me up with you guys for the chat was that I, um, when I gave my TED talk, I talked about Richard Branson. He's my, my favorite billionaire and one of the few that I truly admire, right? Um, I, I love so many things about how he does business. But one of the things that I really admire about him also is the guy was dyslexic. He was painfully dyslexic. And um, another example is um, Charles Schwab. Now, Charles Schwab has these um, discount brokerages here in the United States. He's very, very successful. The man is so painfully dyslexic, he can't do the, you know, the things that uh, a, a typical business, you know, career mid-manager would have to do, right? So instead, you know, when you limit people in one way, there, there's somebody else here in Naples I met recently. He's a very successful businessman. He can't do some things. So he says, yeah, so I had to hire people of talent to do those things for me. And this guy said something a little bit mean if you're uh, an MBA and, you know, uh, he said, you know, I can hire all sorts of MBAs um, and I'm their boss and that's fine. He's like, <laughs> kind of uh, almost dismissive and that was impolite, but you know, the, the fact of the matter <laughs> is, the fact of the matter is he's like, you know, you can hire talent. One of the biggest mistakes that um, entrepreneurs make is they want to do everything themselves. And, and the nice thing about having a, some type of a disability is that, you know, there's many bad things that aren't nice about it. But if you're a Branson or a Charles Schwab or this guy, you can't do those things. So you're not going to go into business if MBA. Oh, you have an MBA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I can't tell you how many good friends I have. How many successful <laughs> business leaders, how many successful entrepreneurs have an MBA? I'm not bad. I no, speak I, to, I, I, I'm just I teasing. speak to business schools, all right? I'm not. <laughs> I hated it, by the way. Uh, I, I'm I sorry? absolutely flunked all of the finance bit, you know? I had to yeah, right. But the thing is, you know, you, maybe you flunked the finance bit, but you mastered the leadership, the psychology, the, you know, the things that actually pertain once you get on a leadership track or once you, and you can hire some, you know, I have always had to hire accountants and um, financiers when I, um, financiers sounds a little fancy for somebody with a small business, but, you know, like uh, I had to hire um, first a bookkeeper, then a, um, then a CFO as my business grew because I couldn't do that stuff. The nice thing about not being able to do that stuff is you find somebody who's really able to work with you, which is tough. You find that person, you work together in a collaborative way. It frees you up to do other things. Yeah. Every time, you know, this sounds a little, little touchy feely, but every time, you know, nature shuts a window, it opens a door kind of thing. Um, it's true with disabilities. You know, a lot of, if you are a quadriplegic, okay, you're incredibly limited. 
Um, I have a friend who was in a quadriplegic, but she was in a bike accident, and it caused brain damage, and she had a lot of trouble concentrating sometimes. That is limiting. But most ways, you're not limited, you know? Um, even, even the quadriplegic example, that person's brain is probably completely intact, and they're able to participate in the world, right? So people with disabilities, they can't do this. That allows them to focus on doing this. And um, if we just help them as needed, or if we elevate them as, you know, this person clearly has talent, but not, they're not going to thrive on the test we gave them, got to be flexible in this world. Definitely. And it's often to your benefit. Definitely. What we're, what we're adept as a community of doing is finding alternate ways of doing stuff. It's innovation. Right. You know, accessibility drives innovation. Um, We've overshot the mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now I'll let you guys go. Um, and, uh, and, and it's been fun overshooting the mark. Yes, I'm sorry, it I was teasing you, Ted. I knew I was going to love this one. I knew it. <laughs> uh, it it's, it's been great. So um, I'd like to thank you for, for coming along and chatting with us. We're delighted to have you here. So thank you once again. Thank you, Ted. Uh, it's my pleasure entirely. I, I feel uh, honored, actually, to be invited. Thank you.